Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, do personality disorders increase the risk of dying? So another way to word this would be, does the presence of a personality disorder increase mortality risk? I've also seen a few other questions, like how does the risk of having a personality disorder in terms of mortality compared to other mental disorders? And what about the type A personality? Because we've seen these different reports that that personality type is associated with greater risk. So I'll cover these different questions in this video. So before I get to personality disorders, I'm going to start by covering personality briefly. And what I like to use here when talking about personality theory is the five-factor model, because that has also been related to personality disorders. So there are five high-level factors in personality. It's one way you can look at it. They're called traits. And I remember them through the acronym OCEAN, openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Now, all of them, to some degree, at extremely high or extremely low levels, can have a relationship to mental disorders, especially personality disorders. But the one that's most closely tied with mental health symptoms would be neuroticism. So we hear these different reports about how neuroticism, if somebody has high neuroticism, this predicts mortality. Well, this is actually pretty interesting. If we look at the five-factor model, if we look at these five traits, we see that actually only conscientiousness is tied to mortality risk. So individuals who score in the bottom one-third of conscientiousness, so they have low conscientiousness, this group has a 37% higher mortality rate than individuals who score in the top two-thirds of conscientiousness. But the other four personality traits, openness to experience, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism, have no consistent association with mortality risk. Now, of course, the surprise here is neuroticism, because we know neuroticism is associated with anger and depression and anxiety. So how can there be no mortality risk? Well, we're really not sure why there is no mortality risk here. It is a bit of a surprise, but we do know that neuroticism predicts a number of mental and physical health symptoms. So it's not that high neuroticism should just be ignored. Mortality is just one aspect that mental health clinicians want to be aware of. So neuroticism still comes with a lot of negatives, especially on the high side. But mortality, again, is not one of those negatives as far as we can tell. So what about conscientiousness? Why does conscientiousness seem to have this tie to higher mortality? Well, we believe it's because low conscientiousness is characterized by impulsivity, and impulsivity is dangerous. So that's really, in terms of the five-factor model, that's what we see with mortality risk. Now, I also want to answer that question about the type A personality. So what we see with type A personality is this action-emotion complex characterized by excessive competitive drive, intense striving for achievement, someone who is easily provoked to hostility, somebody who is aggressive, impatient, and people with type A personalities tend to have an exaggerated sense of time urgency. So we look at these factors and we think, well, this must be tied to mortality, right? There must be something going on here because somebody's so driven and intense. Actually, type A personality has no association with mortality risk. So we don't see an increased mortality risk there either. Now this may come as a bit of surprise, but really if we look at the five-factor model again, somebody with a type A personality would not have low conscientiousness. So they wouldn't fit into really the only major risk factor that we can find in that model. So now taking a look at personality disorders specifically. So I've covered personality traits, personality theory, what about the extreme traits? And that's really what personality disorders are. They're really a collection of extreme personality traits that we put together in these disorders. And we know there are 10 personality disorders listed in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. So a personality disorder is a mental disorder. It's just a specific type of mental disorder. The personality disorders are divided into three clusters. Cluster A, which is the odd eccentric, paranoid, schizoid, schizotypal, Cluster B, which is the most studied, contains antisocial, narcissistic, borderline, and histrionic. It is the dramatic erratic cluster. And cluster C, which is the anxious, fearful cluster, contains avoidant, dependent, 
and obsessive compulsive personality disorders. So we know that about 10% of the population has at least one personality disorder. And personality disorders are associated with a number of comorbid mental health problems. And what this means is that personality disorders tend to co-occur with other mental disorders, including other personality disorders. So other than the personality disorders that co-occur, we see substance use disorders, major mood disorders like depression and bipolar. We also see a lot of other co-occurring characteristics like physical health problems, including cardiovascular disease. Now, when we study personality disorders, it's not always straightforward because some of the studies only look at extreme personality traits. They don't categorize those traits into personality disorders. And some personality constructs don't have a clear correlate with a personality disorder. For example, psychopathy has a connection to antisocial personality disorder, but they're not the same thing. So when we look at the research literature, sometimes we really have to kind of figure out what personality disorder could be related to the findings, because again, some studies don't directly look at the personality disorders. So that's kind of a brief explanation of personality disorders, but what about mortality? How do we measure mortality? What is mortality? Well, when we look at the research literature on mortality, we see that it's really studied in a few different ways. We see terms like natural mortality, unnatural, all-cause mortality. So what mortality really is, is dying, right? So a risk of mortality is a risk of dying. So to understand the relationship between personality disorders and mortality, we have to know what type of mortality we're talking about and how we're measuring it. Now, one of the most popular ways to measure mortality is through something called the Standardized Mortality Rate, or SMR. And the SMR is calculated by dividing the observed number of deaths in any particular group by the expected number of deaths by age and gender in the population. So just to give an example, say that you had a group of a thousand people that you're studying, and we would expect that 10 of those people would die in a particular time period, and 20 actually die. So for that study, for that group of a thousand people, the SMR is equal to 2. 20, which is the number that died, divided by 10, which is the number that we're expected to die. So that really means that for that group, the mortality rate is twice as high than you would expect. That's, again, an SMR of 2. So let's take a look at some of the SMRs for all-cause mortality. So this is mortality that could come about from any cause. This could be homicide, an accident, a physical health disease, anything. Now remember, the expected value of an SMR would be 1. So what we see here is that clients with personality disorders have an SMR of about 3 to 6 in terms of all-cause mortality. So that's 3 to 6 times higher than we would expect to see in the general population. Now, when we look at kind of breaking that down a little bit, we see if we're looking at personality disorders alone, so people that have personality disorders without comorbidity, the SMR is about 4.5. When we look at personality disorders comorbid with other mental disorders, but excluding substance use disorders, because they are particularly dangerous in terms of mortality, we see an SMR of 7.5. And if we include substance use disorders, so this is personality disorder, comorbid with substance use disorder, the SMR goes up to 16. Now this is already staggeringly high, but unfortunately it can actually get higher under certain circumstances. If we look at individuals who have been diagnosed with a personality disorder who have been frequently hospitalized, so we're talking about inpatient versus outpatient, we see that the SMR for men is about 15. So that's comparable to personality disorder with substance use comorbidity. But for women, the SMR goes up to around 38. So women who have a personality disorder who are frequently hospitalized are really at the greatest risk among people who have personality disorders, at least in terms of mortality. Now one theory we see here is that individuals with personality disorders who are hospitalized must really explain all the mortality, and those treated as outpatients must be at lower risk. But what we actually see here is that there's excess mortality observed for clients diagnosed with personality disorders in both inpatient and outpatient settings, although the mortality risk is substantially higher for those that require hospitalization. But still, 
it's not just the data from hospitalizations that drive the mortality rate higher. So we have to be aware that all people with personality disorders carry an increased risk, regardless of what type of treatment they're receiving, like inpatient, again, versus outpatient. So there I was talking about all-cause mortality. But what if we look at certain causes? Now, one of the most common causes to look at when talking about personality disorders in terms of mortality is suicide. And when the personality disorders are evaluated independently, we see that several personality disorder dimensions kind of emerge as a risk factor for attempting. Now, among these personality disorder dimensions, we see paranoid, antisocial, borderline, histrionic, and dependent personality disorders. So we see one represented from cluster A, three from cluster B, and one represented from cluster C. Now we know that about 10% of individuals with borderline personality disorder will at some point end their life. It's a tragic statistic. And unfortunately, we see higher rates in studies that have a longer follow-up period. So borderline personality disorder really stands out in terms of mortality risk. We also see with borderline personality disorder that 60 to 70 percent of the individuals who have the disorder will make an attempt during the course of the illness. Borderline personality disorder also has high comorbidity with other disorders and a number of other associated characteristics that carry a risk. For example, depression, substance use, trauma, and emotional dysregulation all carry a risk of mortality. Now, interestingly, specifically around suicide attempts, negative affect is actually the most robust trait predictor. So, of course, negative affect is usually pronounced in a number of individuals who have borderline personality disorder. So it kind of explains why some of that risk may be there. Now, borderline personality disorder isn't the only personality disorder dimension associated with mortality. We also see that psychopathy and antisocial personality disorder carry a pronounced risk. For high psychopathy groups, so individuals who score high in psychopathy, the SMR is about five, so five times the risk of the general population. With antisocial personality disorder, we see that the SMR equals about 8.5, so quite a bit higher than psychopathy. And this is because we see the impulsivity component is much stronger with antisocial personality disorder than it would be in general when talking about psychopathy. Now this gets a little bit complex because psychopathy actually has two types, and it's that second type that's associated with antisocial personality disorder, and that second type, again, that has impulsivity. So that explains really why psychopathy appears different than antisocial personality disorder when we talk about standardized mortality risk. What we see with psychopathy and antisocial personality disorder in terms of deaths is that they're caused by a number of factors, including accidents, homicides. We know that intoxication plays a role in many of the deaths. And we also see that several characteristics of psychopathy contribute to increased mortality. I mentioned impulsivity, but we also see novelty seeking, which is related to impulsivity, and a need for stimulation, so sensation seeking, which again is also part of that second factor of psychopathy that's related to antisocial personality disorder. So I talked about personality disorders and some different SMR figures, but what about personality disorders compared to other mental disorders? Do personality disorders carry a greater risk? Are people with personality disorders at less of a risk? Well, what we see here when we compare is that there are some differences. If we look at schizophrenia, for example. The SMR with schizophrenia is around 2.5. So if we look at like cluster B personality disorders, like borderline and antisocial personality disorders, the SMR is thought to be higher, of course. Bipolar disorder has an SMR of 2. So again, personality disorders are generally higher. Now, if we want to compare these SMRs to something that we would see from like the world of physical health, we see that the SMR for heavy smoking, which we know is quite dangerous, that SMR is 2.5. So it's comparable to schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, but much lower than what we see for borderline personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder. So this really just puts this whole situation in terms of mortality and personality disorders into context. Again, heavy smoking, we know that's dangerous, and somehow personality disorders tend to carry a higher mortality risk. There's a few things to remember here, though. 
It's not all personality disorders. Some personality disorders, again, have fairly low SMRs. It seems that most of the risk is kind of contained to the cluster B personality disorders. And on top of this, treatment of these personality disorders can reduce the mortality risk by quite a bit. Now, the treatment success levels with cluster B personality disorders are highly dependent on the individual, highly dependent on what type of treatment they receive. There's a lot of different factors. We do know, in general, though, that cluster B personality pathology tends to lessen over time. So if somebody receives treatment, and then we combine that with the lessening of the symptom severity over time, we can see a reduction in mortality risk. So it's not really all bad news. I wouldn't want anybody to see this and think, well, look, these numbers are staggering, and there's really no hope. That's not the case. There is a lot of hope. We just have to recognize that there are real risks associated with personality disorders and take them seriously from a treatment perspective. Meaning if somebody has a personality disorder, it's important they get into treatment. And if somebody's in the mental health treatment community, again, from a clinical point of view, we need to look at these disorders and treat them with our best efforts and treat them with methods that are empirically based. So I know whenever I talk about personality disorders, including borderline personality disorder, there are going to be a lot of different opinions. People who agree with me or disagree with me or who have other thoughts, please put those opinions in the comments section. They always generate a really interesting dialogue, and this is certainly an important topic. As always, I hope you found this description of personality disorders and mortality risks to be interesting. Thanks for watching.